Hello, this is Max. Hope you've enjoyed the last few videos I have put out. The first one about Revelation 6 and the seven seals of God being broken. The next one entitled, Has the First Trumpet of Revelation Sounded? And my first video that is based on a book I wrote, Strong Delusion, The Deception of the End Times. I'll be doing some more videos based upon my book in the future. Today I'd like to continue in the book of Revelation covering chapter 7. Now this video was also going to include the second trumpet in Revelation chapter 8, but the video was going to end up being far too long. So this video is just going to deal with Revelation 7 and the first verse in Revelation chapter 8. So yeah, it was going to be way too long. Um, Revelation 7 is what you would consider a parenthetical chapter, as it interrupts the prophecy concerning the sixth seal in Revelation 6 and the seventh seal about, spoken about in Revelation 8. It speaks of the four angels who are to not hurt the earth or the sea or any trees until 144,000 servants of God are sealed from the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Now this could simply be that there will be in fact 12,000 chosen from each tribe listed in the chapter living at the time when this prophecy occurs. This is possible. You know, God could have preserved 12,000 of each of these tribes throughout the centuries that they're living somewhere. Um, or it could be God choosing 144,000 people from the world to become the 12 tribes. Um, it's possible that there's not enough people of each. You know, Abraham was once chosen, and he wasn't Jewish when he was chosen. He was from, you know, he was from what you consider modern-day Persia or Babylon or uh, Baghdad or around that area. So, um, and there are people that were chosen that were a part of the bloodline of Jesus Christ who were not, were not Jewish or Israeli or anything like that. So, um, so he could choose brand new people, or there are in fact that many people have been preserved over the years. Now, of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that this is referring to their religion, and these people have already been chosen. This is stupid, and I don't have time to go into the absurdity of this. So, but many Bible commentators, scholars, Christians, and non-Christians alike have debated for centuries as to if there are, in fact, members of what is considered the lost tribes of Israel. I could do a whole series of very long videos on this, but I won't. The main thing to understand from this chapter is that God will, in fact, have a remnant of what he considers Israel to evangelize in the last days, and at the end of the chapter, untold multitudes of people will be brought to God through them. Okay, so I'm moving on to chapter 8 in the first verse, which says, When he opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. The seventh seal, when it is broken, produces this moment of silence. Many people have speculated as to what this is. What I have to say is that there is never silence in heaven, for the Bible says in Revelation and in Isaiah that the cherubim and seraphim sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, day and night without rest. So it sounds to me like it's never quiet. You know, not including, I'm sure there's plenty of other singing and talking and stuff going on. Uh, my thought is that perhaps this is the moment when the Lord prepares to return to earth, and therefore there is no one in heaven to sing, for the entire heavenly host are with him when he makes his return. Now this also has to do with one of the traditions of the Jewish wedding. Okay, and the Jewish wedding in, in, in scripture is very important to follow, because the Bible follows this outline in many books, in many places. The wedding... A wedding, the traditional wedding in Judaism, shows the how Christ redeemed us and returns, and that we're His bride. And so, it's very important to understand this. And it goes hand in hand with things like the holy days of the Lord. Anyway, the first part of the Jewish wedding includes writing out a marriage contract, exchanging a dowry and giving of gifts, um, the drinking of wine and bread. An animal, usually a lamb, and perhaps a goat, a heifer as well, depending upon how many people are there, are killed for a betrothal meal. And then a brief period where the bride and groom are together before he leaves, and a vow to return to the bride after the husband builds them a both a home, which is usually an extension of his father's house. The bridegroom and bride will generally go through, a peri through periods of fasting while they are apart. Today, couples in Judaism will fast like 24 hours before their actual wedding day. When he returns, he comes with the wedding party, trumpets blaring and music playing, um, the people are carrying uh, torches and lanterns, um, the bride and her maiden, maidens or virgins, they come out to meet him, and then he picks her out of the group of, of the virgins and places a veil over her to symbolize to everyone that she is the one he chose. 
It all goes back to when Jacob was deceived in his first marriage. By the groom pla placing the veil over her himself, he stops any chance of being deceived into marrying the wrong woman, as Jacob was deceived by his father-in-law Laban. Then the whole wedding party follows the couple to a bridal canopy or hoopah. The hoopah or bridal canopy is said to represent the new home but the, oh, that they both will be living in. Another idea is that it represents the heavenly domed sky above with the four corners representing the four pillars of, of both heaven and earth, which seems to go really well with Revelation 7 where you've got four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Well, maybe they're holding the, full, the four pillars up. Um... The bride and bridegroom then then circle each other seven times, signifying the cutting of a covenant. In ancient times, when two people agreed on a covenant, animals were cut in half, and both parties would circle in and out of the pieces in a figure eight, just confirming that if either party were to break the covenant, the same fate would befall on them. Then the groom gives the bride a ring. Today, both the groom and the bride give each other rings. It is also said that a crown was given to each one of them on this day. Uh, many cultures today still do this, and we know that we know that Christ returns when he returns, he will give us crowns. Now the couple will recite seven blessings as well as the marriage contract in front of the wedding party. Then they both drink from a cup, and the glass is broken. When they say Mazel Tov. Now, in certain tradition in Mazel Tov, I mean, by them breaking the glass, it symbolizes the frail. The some people say it symbolizes the destruction of the Jewish temple. And that marriage is fragile, and you know, so like glass, it can break. Um, now, in certain traditional Judaism, the bride and groom are taken to a private chamber where they sit silently with each other for a short period of time. This is called a yakud, um, and it usually lasts between ten minutes or an hour. It seemed to be the general time period being about thirty minutes, so half an hour. Um, and then the two witnesses stand outside their door. During this time, the bridegroom and bride, bride will enjoy a small meal of bread and wine, depending upon tradi and depending upon traditions, consummate the marriage physically. After this, the two witnesses would be told by the couple that they're ready to come out. Okay, and now part of the job of the two witnesses, not only were they supposed to be there in the first part of their betrothal to confirm that the marriage contract was signed, um, is to go in there and check the bed sheets for blood to confirm that the bride was in fact a virgin. Now, they don't do a lot of this today, and a lot of the um, traditional Judaism doesn't actually, um, they don't actually consummate the marriage during this time. They just use it as a quiet period for the couple. Um, but this is what it actually goes back to. Anyway, then the two witnesses then announce them both, and the wedding party cheers with excitement as the feast begins, usually lasting about seven days, sometimes 14. The Bible mentions both. Um, after the feast, then after it's over, after seven days, the bride and bridegroom then retreat to their new home, well, they will spend the rest of their lives together. So this 30 minutes of silence sounds just like, to me, a yakut. It's just 30 minutes of silence. And this came to me just recently. Because I thought about this 30 minutes, not knowing for sure what it was. And this makes perfect sense. So, if you read Revelation carefully, and you look at it from the wedding, the uh, Judaic wedding um, position, you'll see all the, all the things of a wedding covered in the book of Revelation. So this is maybe what it all is, and I find it very, I find it very fascinating that it is there. So um, you should study more up on the Jewish Jewish wedding. You'll really get to understand the holy days and the feast, of, the feast of the Lord, and stuff like that, and give you a better understanding of all this. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, and um, I'm, like I said, I'm working on the second half of this, or the, or the Revelation chapter eight, verse eight video, the second trumpet here real soon. So. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and take care, and I'll talk to you soon. God bless.